Yeah, da, 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 da. Go live. Go live. Go live. <laughs> oh, hello everyone. And no, my sister has not been hooking today. No, no, no. I was walking the floppy research assistant and we were late starting our walk because honestly there were a load of medical discussions going on for my mum today. So, you know, normal stuff. Normally fa normal family stuff as you have relatives getting older. Um, but basically it all took up time and yes, life happened. Life happened and well I have distressing news incredibly distressing news really absolutely massively distressing news mighty two distressing points of news one I can't find my stapler to save my life at the moment which is really annoying because I printed out my um, things for tomorrow because I've got a TV recording to go to tomorrow, um, a program recording, and I've printed out all my notes and all my questions, and I can't stay on the cover. Helpful. Other, more, even more distressing news. I'm not buying a new stapler. I've got one around here somewhere. Drubbers is a clear one. I should have probably got a bright orange one or a bright pink one. Then I'd find it. Um, I'm down to the last bottle of the D-S-I-R-E-E-R, -E -E no, D-S-I-B-E-R, yes, this is the last bottle of the Domestic Strategic Iron Brew Emergency Reserve. Steel Sister Stapler. That is the option I am currently considering. Um, or alternatively, perhaps she's stolen mine, and that's why I can't find it. I'm not saying that my sister would steal my stapler, it just it wouldn't be the first time. But no, I'm sure I'm sure she has it somewhere. So hello everyone. Hello, Peter Dawson, Carl Gasberg, Michael Cooch. Uh, Michael, I hope I've been able to answer your questions well. You keep putting interesting questions up and I keep trying to answer them, but um, yeah. Basically, the answer for the um, Battle Lisa thing is, as I've said, uh, the Battle Lisa question you put forward is, why am I talking about this being the only fleet battle when, you know, there were battles between in South America between ironclads, etc. And there were even some sort of battles between sort of ironclads at various points in, um, in uh, Japan at various points. The thing is, this was a fleet battle between ironclads, and it wasn't just one or two ironclads on each side. It was a lot of them. It was a full squadron of ironclads. It wasn't a case of, oh, we've got an ironclad. Oh, isn't it special? Isn't it pretty? No, this was the latest, greatest thing. So they had an impact. And that's what happened, basically, there. Um, for Battle Lisa. Stephen Richards, hello. Night Seeker, everyone, hello. Carver Gasberg, hello. Um, Bob Fry, hello. Um, DG40, hello. Hello, Duke of Betching. Actually, today, um, I didn't have my sister's cooking. I had, um, I had what I'm told by, by, um, Pizza Hut in the UK is an authentic New York pizza at 16 inches. It's authentic. Who knows? Sorry for the slip there. Hello, Black Bear Maximus. Hello, Colin Cameron. Hello, David Golding. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? Hello, C. Mitchell. Hello, Malaga. So, just one. Been reading the Corvette book you recommended. Enjoying it so far. Thanks for the recommendation. Glad you're enjoying it. 
Corbett is an interesting soul. So, let's start off by discussing tonight's discussion. This is, of course, Patreon 81. It's courtesy of Michael66. And the first thing that needs to be really said about it is that I'm probably not going to say anything startling because in a nicest way, a scenario which involves the Royal Navy in the Age of, Seal, uh, Age of Sail from the point they actually have control of the sea to the point uh, to, you know, to when the Age of Steam really starts to come around and the Age of Iron and all the other things that come about. Well, those those times when they come closest and they do or they do lose control of the sea, they are kind of big events, so they are kind of going to be spotted. Saying that, there are quite a lot of events which they do tend to characterise as the Royal Navy's lost control of the sea, and you go, have they? Have they really? Or did they have it in the first place, or was it disputed? And that's one of the other things you have to consider in the wartime especially between peers or near peers or collections of peers, um, control of the sea can be disputed between multiple parties. And it often is. And if you're wondering if I have very strange spots here and here, don't get scratched by a poodle's ball. Is all I would say. Basically, he put his paw up last night to whack in a playful manner and it caught. So now I have well, combined with that mold over there, I have a little triangle going across my face. Anyway, leaving that all to one side and I'm very glad, Bob Fry, that you have got Iron Baru. Um... They are, uh... How to put this? Whilst there are many events which people do point to, there is actually only one real war, one real period where it's actually the case. Where the Royal Navy both has sea power and has sea con uh, control of the sea and loses it. And that war does leave a legacy. It does. But tonight, as always, is live, which means it's going to be involve a lot of discussions. A lot of questions. I won't have a separate Q&A section open, because... I'm not sure I fit in the screen with the slides. But... I hope you all enjoy it. So first off, of course, the traditional shameless book plug. I'm glad some of you do have Iron Brew. Um, my rations are very, very low. So far, my last three orders have all ended up with no Iron Brew being delivered. <laughs> Including one from Amazon, which got cancelled. Just, just terrible. Okay, it's terrible. <sighs> Combine that with... Um... Well, let's put it this way. I had an interesting conversation with someone the other day, which was basically along the lines of, Oh, so well, it, it, you've got to 10,000 subscribers. Oh, you got to 100,000. Does that mean you could give up working universities? I went, no, but I would probably give up about half the universities I work for. Because, <sighs> again, pay is late. That's a little nice of them is they've told me in advance the pay is going to be late. But, yeah. So let's start off with the ground rules and some explaining explanation of the ground rules. In order to lose something, you have to have had it in the first place, which kind of rules out the Medway Ring of 1667, as the Royal Navy didn't have it then. Let's be honest, in 1667, as strong as the Royal Navy is, they're not exactly the uncontested power of the world at this point. Uh, as much as they would like their ego to be so, uh, there is a significant Dutch fleet, which nixed them, 
and there is a significant French fleet and a significant Spanish fleet wandering around the world. Secondly, are we talking about global naval superiority or local? Now, this is an important thing to consider because one is local, one is fleeting, and, can, and it's basically can be righted and changed by the moon or the squadron. But as we were discussing with certain battles recently, the Royal Navy moving in and out ships in and out of the Caribbean and the French moving ships in and out of the Caribbean meant that it was a constantly shifting, changing balance of who was the most powerful. And it was a battle which eventually decided it, but the battle, if it had taken place slightly earlier, would have been a completely different numerology, in a numerous sort of uh, number sta uh, stats in terms of the numbers of one side versus the numbers of the other side. So, this is an ever-changing, ever-moving feast. There is also an argument about the real or perceived loss of command. Because Admiral Bing is executed because of a perceived loss due to his failure to relieve Mallorca in 1756. But the reality was shown when the French plans to invade Britain were crushed in 1759. And that was due to, of course, Admiral Hawke at Quiberon Bay. Because, let's be honest, the real important thing for Britain wasn't necessarily having the largest fleet off Mallorca. It was making sure that the French couldn't invade Britain. Now, you can argue there are certain events which do weaken the Western Squadron, and therefore those events have to be considered. Because if the Western Squadron is weakened, that's a scenario where Britain can lose control of the sea. Thirdly, it needs to be significant losses, i.e. the war for Austria in succession, 1744 to 48. It's often pointed to. There I have seen a fair number of articles where, you know, they go, ah, Britain loses its control in this period. And you sort of go, well, does A, Britain have necessarily control in this period? But B, when you aggregate the losses, broadly speaking... Britain loses 14 ships of line, 7 frigates, 28 small ships, 3,238 merchant vessels, 1,012 guns, and roughly 7,000 sailors. Which is a lot, until you put it together that Spain and France together lose 23,000 sailors, so more than three times as many between them. 37 ships of the line which is more, two and a half times as many. Well, more than that, really. It's damn near three times as many. 23 frigates, which is more than three times as many. At least 20 smaller ships, potentially more, but it depends on what you're grading as a smaller ship versus an armed merchant ship, and... It gets all sort of complicated, so let's just put it as at least 20. 3,561 merchant vessels. Okay, that's, that's not as far apart as the British would like it to be. And 2,288 guns. That's a lot of cannon. That's a lot of cannon to be lost. Now... I would add something on top of that. One of the interesting things about merchant vessels is that they're counted as a loss, but there is one ship which was captured from a convoy it had detached itself off from Britain by the French. Recaptured by the British. Captured by the Spanish. Recaptured by the British. And made it home. So that ship equals two of the British losses and one of the French and one of the Spanish losses, according to the source of the stats. So... Yeah, but the stats can be interesting. Hello, DH89. The stats can be incredibly interesting. Pete Dawson, 37 divided by 14 is 2.643. So more than two and a half times. So 
So those are the ground rules. Does anyone object to the ground rules? What do you think of the ground rules? Do they seem fair? Hello, Felix B. Hello, Tenerife. That sounds like a nice place to be. Hello, Team in Locker. No, everyone seems happy with the rules. The ground rules established. That's nice. That is nice. It's not. It is night out of the Atlantic. I can guess. So, what does it all mean? Well, it's got to be post the Seven Years' War. Because if we consider the Seven Years' War and the events of the Seven Years' War, that war is the only... That is the war where, post it, the Royal Navy really is the global power it's going to become. And remember, this is a war which actually lasts... Mm, six years, eight months. I think it's like a couple of days short of nine months. Six years, nine months. And... It has some very, very fun treaties as a result. But pretty much, France and Spain end up returning their conquered territory to Britain and Portugal. France gives North America possessions, East and Mississippi River, plus Canada, the islands of St. Vincent, Tobago, Tobago Dominica and Grenada, and the Northern Circus in the Indian Ocean to Britain. France also has to give Louisiana and its North American territory west of the Mississippi to Spain. And Spain has to give Florida to Great Britain. And the Mughal Empire has to cede Bengal to Great Britain. So, yeah. Seven Years' War. One of the most important wars you hardly ever hear much about. Which is quite sad, because there are some pretty cool battles in it. There are some very, very cool battles in it. And... There are some very cool operations in it. But... And this is the important point to make, really. It's also the first war where Britain really gets to grow as a global sea power. And they do start de becoming a global sea power. Prior to this, Britain's been trying to, considering it, supporting it. But this is the one where they really are developing it and pushing it forward. And this, of course, is the a war which has the Battle of Quiberon Bay in it. So, if you consider one of the earlier points I've made, and the example I have given, you know, lose, loss of Mallorca, Battle of Quiberon Bay in 1759. Well, yeah, it's the Seven Years' War. So, in the Seven Years' War, we've had the dip, we've had the rise up. But the thing is, prior to this, we didn't really have the level of sea control or sea power which we would claim later in the Age of Sail, which we would have post it. Before it, we had an idea of our importance and status. After it, we had it. There is a difference. 
So I would. Uh, so in that scenario, I would be arguing that Bing is a victim of ego. You can also argue that uh, there is something different about a fleet which knows its animals can be executed if they fail to do their job. And Mars Britain never executed another admiral for it. The fact is that every admiral ever since has known it's there as an option. You can might sit there and think, no, that won't happen. But then you have to remember things like, hmm, Britain has a habit, has some very interesting habits as a nation. And whilst it might not happen, can you be sure it won't happen? And if you can't be sure it won't happen, can you really rely on it not happening? It's fun. It's the history of the world at the time. So yeah, it's got to be post the Seven Years' War. Again. Post the, ba uh, the Battle of Quiveron Bay, but also with the establishment of a lot of the British infrastructure, the regularising and organising of the fleets, all the scenarios which are going on with the Royal Navy to create the force that it's going to be, and the creation of the Western Squadron as it becomes. Again, am I making a logical? Uh, am I making sense? Are you following my points? Because it's worthwhile checking in for you. I will never understand why they start the timings of a live viewing at 6 a.m. in the morning and you're sort of going so I have to, to until you get the chart information I have to go slide all the way to the other side the joys the joys of YouTube alright so which war are we left with? where does it happen? well there are actually two scenarios where it happens, and the first is the American Revolutionary War. Nice, so after this, the Iron becomes paranoid and not losing control of the sea. Um, no, after this, the Royal Navy actually has control of the sea after the Seven Years' War. It's after this, the Royal Navy becomes paranoid about losing control of the sea. And it's the American Revolutionary War, Anglo-French War. It's really the Anglo-French War. Of 1778 to 1783. Because let's be honest, the American Revolutionary War, for all its its grandiose statements, has <laughs> absolutely nothing to do with the sea. In terms of what of what the British should do, uh, you know, effects on the Royal Navy's calculations. The Americans, the Revolutionary American forces, do not have a naval force. They have some privateers at points. They have various things. They are they are brave. They do some great land, some glorious eager, some glorious statements. But they are ultimately nothing. Ultimately, they are nothing as it compares to British naval power at the time. What really starts to cause the British trouble is when the French get involved. Because the British are militarily stretched and their government is trying to fight a war on the cheap. That's the trouble. The Ameri British government have been trying to fight the American War of Independence on the cheap. Uh, that sometimes sounds terrible to say. Because people go, well, you know, surely they valued America and all these things. Well, yeah, they valued it, but only to a certain amount. And they took them serious only to a certain point. 
And it was only when the French and Spanish got inside, on side, uh, got involved and were on side that actually they got worried about it. But there again, they were only so worried about it. And this is one of the problems you have because you've had basically a land warfare war mobilization and limited in maritime war, but very limited maritime war as well. You haven't needed much naval involvement. And... Because of that... The Navy hasn't mobilised at the same time as the Army. The Navy hasn't mobilised at the same level. And suddenly the Anglo-French War springs up. And yes, you can say, the Anglo-French War, that's, there's a lot of reasons for that to, to come about. But it was also a bit of strategic surprise. The British were expecting it to be a bit... How do I put this? They were expecting the Bourbon War, as it becomes known in certain parts of the world, to... to come later. Now, it's one of the interesting things is it is to an extent Louis the Sixteenth uh, deciding to ally with France. Um, due to the failure of the British Saratoga campaign. And the Saratoga campaign, for those who don't know, ended in the surrender of General Burgoyne's army. And also began a civil war within the Iroquois. Now... The trouble for the British in a large part of this was that the British strategy and General Burgoyne in general was led by Lord Germain who frankly was a bit of a mm, and he was the Secretary of State for the Colonies and as I've been over before with Lord jo with uh, <clears throat> how do I put this properly Lord George Germain uh, he is an interesting character and manages to cause a lot of trouble because no he he could not under any circumstance work with anyone else he would not be a team player no matter what experience suggested you should do no matter how things were supposed to be done Jermaine would go a different way for the sake of doing it a different way Jermaine existed to cause disruption. That was his greatest joy. He was sure and absolutely certain he was right. The only thing greater than his level of self-confidence was his inability to see his own stupidity. And this was the man in charge of directing the war against the Americans. The administrative man in, in charge of directing the war against the Americans. So yeah, the Revolutionary War was lost against the Americans. <sighs> Due to Germain being quite so interesting, quite so um, spectacularly interesting, you have a lot of divided resources, and you have a lot of disputed resources. Uh, for example, the Admiralty likes to move everything by convoy. They have learnt this lesson. When did they learn this lesson? Well, if we go back, 
They learned this lesson in um, an earlier conflict called the War for Austrian Succession, where they lost a lot of merchant ships. But uh, Germain doesn't like to move them by, uh, by, by convoy. He likes to have them sailing independently. So, that's what's been going on in the American Revolutionary War, broadly speaking. Basically, the British have been let down by the quality of their leadership on the strategic level. And some of the decisions on the local level. But as we've been over several times before, there are some good ships, good units involved, fighting... You can see where there are good officers commanding. You can see where there are not. For uh, One of the other problems with Germain being in charge is that Germain is obsessed with status at court and has ensured... has ensured that the people who are sent to uh, North America are suitably politically connected rather than necessarily being capable, per uh, capable personnel. Some they are still. Some of them are still very fairly capable personnel and very good, hard-working personnel, but they're not exactly Britain sending its A game, and that is a problem. And it has an impact in the first couple of years of the Anglo-French War, and you can see that in what happens. And then you can see what happens next. So. Hello, Abzaski, and hello, Cody85. The Battle of Grenada. I've covered that battle on this channel. That's, of course, a loss for British. And that's a, a loss which leads to a large French fleet turning up in North America. And, yeah. That force ultimately doesn't achieve its aim but the moment you start having large American a uh, large French fleets turning up in North America in British colonial areas capturing British territory and not really being disputed the British have lost control of the sea And no longer is the sea theirs to use as their will. No longer is the sea available for them to use for their capabilities. It is disputed at best. At worst, they've lost it. My coach, some of the reason Britain sent their A team was that many of them refused to serve against America for political reasons. Not agreeing on the war approach. Uh, that is often used as uh, a catch rule by many, many, um, many historians. Um, you also have to remember that some officers refused appointments for which they were never even considered because of political reasons. So one of the great interests is there is a, um, oh, which general was it? I forget which general it was, but actually refused an appointment after it had been granted to someone else. He wrote a letter to someone saying, I have, you know, I, I refused this appointment. I didn't want it. And we can never find any records of him being offered it. But the letter he wrote to someone who was more famous, and so we've kept their letter, got their letters, has gone on in history, and so they've gone, he has refused to uh, refused it. Well, we never found any letter showing that he was being appointed it. And, believe it or not, even jo Lord George Germain cannot just appoint someone as a general of an important place without first checking in with a couple of our allies. And we have a lot of their letters. So we can't verify this. So therefore, probably it wasn't offered. But there are a lot of people who are grandstanding at various points. And it's, it's one of the beautiful things of history. So yes, some are refusing to serve 
because they don't like the way the war is and being fought in America. Um, I'd say there's a 50-50 split between those who think the war needs to be fought more harshly and the war that those who think the war needs to be fought more cleverly. I more one of the one thinks about more winning hearts and minds. The other one thinks more crushing them under a jackboot. Um, but. There, and there is a large group who don't want to fight, uh, don't want to get involved in the war because the wrong political party are in charge of the government, and so they object to it on those grounds. This is one of the interesting things about this war is that you will get a far more professionalised armed forces after the war is over. In that, by the uh, at the beginning of this war period, this war fighting period in 1775, you have an army command and even a navy command which is very heavily politically dependent and by the end of it they are professionals and it doesn't matter what your political views are you serve if you are requested to serve and if you don't serve it's not considered oh well someone else will let you back in when you've got your when you're you know prepared to serve under the government you know when they're the right political views you just won't get asked back ever and that is the big change which is coming through in this period and it takes time for that to be solid there are personalities who achieve very interesting things even later than this point but it is coming and it is really this war which sees the transition land. Now, you then have this, the Battle of Martinique. And I haven't picked all the battles in this period to give you a sort of discussion on point, but the Battle of Martinique is a good one to go for because it is, an ad it is admirals who we normally expect to win. The Battle of Martinique is one of those battles where we would go... Why? Ha what, what? What happened? Why didn't they win? And specifically, we're talking about the 1781. The 1779 one had been 13 ships of the line under Hyde Parker versus three French ships of the line. And unsurprisingly, the British won, won that one. But um, they only captured, uh, Hyde Parker had only, ca only managed to capture nine merchant vessels of the 26 merchant ships the French were escorting in the battle, and the four merchant ships were destroyed. And he got two ships of the line damaged. The 1780 battle, well that's between Rodney, Sir George Rodney, Admiral Rodney, against Comte de Guichin, who is... Not anywhere near the best of the French officers available, but he's fairly decent. Rodney has 20 ships of the line. The French have 23. It's indecisive. It might as well be a loss. The command structure breaks down at several points in the battle for the Royal Navy. At several points in the battle, Rodney feels his ships aren't doing the role they're doing the job they're supposed to. And aren't fighting like they are supposed to. He has rear admirals, Hyde Parker and Joshua Rowley, assisting him. And um, Commodores Thomas uh, Collingwood and uh, William Hopfen at the battle. 
Think about that. The, there are some very senior, very capable officers. Officers who are names later on. And this battle doesn't work. And these officers are, let's be honest, Rodney would be considered a team. Admiral Ho uh, the future Admiral Hotham is not exactly going to be considered B team. Joshua Rowley goes on to become a vice admiral and again is quite a successful naval officer. Again, not exactly a B team member. Hyde Parker, for all his wants, not a bad admiral. In command of the van in a 90 gun HMS Princess Royal. And well, the French fleet, in contrast, is severely lacking in senior officers and experienced personnel. It really is. It's severely lacking. Sorry. As you grow older, as most of you know, you stop having hair coming out your head as a male. You start having hair off your ears and hair coming out your nose. And sometimes they start sticking out. And then it looks weird on camera. And then you notice it and go, oh, frigate. So not only do I have a triangle on my head, thanks to, uh, thanks to an overly patty poodle, but I now have a hair sticking out. I love high definition imagery. It shows everything. But yes, the French did lose a lot. But this is not the sort of battle which the British are expecting there to be a... a great loss. And the fact is, the Anglo-French War ends with France winning. It ends with the Treaty of Versailles, which goes in the French favour. It ends with Tobago and Guare being acquired by France. This is not a good war for the British. Then you have the Battle of Chesapeake. So, basically, loss, theoretically a draw, despite the British A team showing up, and then the Battle of Chesapeake. The Battle of Chesapeake well... How do I put this politely? The Battle of Chesapeake. 24 French ships of the line. Beat 19 British ships of the line. The British have 5 ships damaged. They scuttle 1. The French have 2 ships damaged. Thomas Graves delivers for the Royal Navy one of their most embarrassing defeats they've had in their history. He doesn't do anything necessarily stupid because... The Admiral de Grasse, the French commander, the Comte de Grasse, he decides to attack British forces 
in Virginia. He decides that's better than going for them in New York, because New York, they're heavily entrenched. He arrives at Chesapeake at the end of August. Admiral Graves, the British Admiral, learns that another Admiral de Barras, the another French Admiral, had sailed from Newport in Rhode Island, and he decided they were going to join forces. So his idea was to take his ships of the line and try and attack de Grasse's fleet before they could. Now, what is worse is that while Graves is doing this, he doesn't also cover a relief force going down or any relief effort going down to Chesapeake. And why does that why does that matter? What is taking place? Well, there is a small issue going on. Lord Cornwallis is at Yorktown in Virginia, besieged. He's one of the better generals the British had in North America, but that's not saying much. And it's one of the more important forces in North America. Again, not saying much, but it is. So it's under siege. The Barras is also bringing siege equipment with him. So here is the thing. The criteria is not necessarily defeating the French, or de de defeating the Grass would have then secured it your way to, to, to open up the route into Cornwallis and would have made things great. But the thing is, if he's got a larger fleet than you, you need to be smart about it. Charging down and offering battle, that's not smart. Charging down and launching a night attack... Launching an attack at night before he realized getting there late in the dark, sending in boats and launching a night attack on the anchorage, that might have been smart. Charging down and offering a battle. Ooh. Now, one of the things that's interesting, though, is the French didn't manage to double up. They didn't use their superior numbers. And remember, they have 24 ships, the British have 19. So, theoretically, they could have doubled up. But actually, they decided to only really get the middle and the forward and the middle sections of the fleet to actually engage each other. And so, we end up with an issue. The British suffer more wounded, they suffer more ships damaged, they scuttle the ship. And the British start off with less ships. But the French don't get the victory they probably could have gone for, especially with Graves in the charge. The thing is, he charges down. He fights a battle in the evening. And then sails opposite the French for several days. With the grass managing to lure Graves away. Away from the Chesapeake. Away from Yorktown. And do you know why this is a problem? Because it allows the Barras to sneak in. The Barras snips in to the, into the bay. Drops off the siege equipment. And so by the time Graves realises this, returns to New York to try and organise a l l relief effort. That's what he theoretically goes back for. He doesn't actually get a relief effort to sail to the 19th of October. The battle took place on the 5th of September. 
Yorktown surrendered on the 17th of October. Talk about lethargy. There are problems with all sorts of levels of British command at this point, but one of the big ones is that the very finely tuned command decisions which had brought victory into Seven Years' War, the combined command, the joined-up thinking, the officers like... Well... If we consider some of the officers involved at Quebec in 1759, there are multiple naval officers, multiple army officers there helping out with the operations, being in charge. It's got a good command team, and they're efficient. But you look through names, you've got James Wolfe, Robert Monckton, John Knox, George Townsend, William Howe, James Murray, and Admiral Sir Charles Saunders. At no point could you imagine Saunders doing a graves and going, you know what, I'm going to charge down to a siege and I'm not going to take the troops with me. I'm not going to take some supply ships with me. Because while the French come out to go and chase him around, that's when his supply ships could have got in. Because just as easy as the British are being distracted by the French, the French fleet's being distracted by the British. So the British could have got supply ships into Yorktown. And when De Barris turned up, he could have turned up and found ships waiting for him going, Hello! Yes, we're a load of frigates. Yes, you know, you can say, oh, well, he's probably, he'll probably bring ships to the line and fix them. He might do. But if you've landed sufficient re reinforcements and food, and you manage to get the supplies in and supplies out, it goes on for about a week. Now, so it's just, it's not good thinking, Anne. My coach, is Graves' action, oh, hello, Ronan. Is Graves' action due to the bing factor? Graves rushing in and offering battle because he doesn't want to be accused of inaction and binged. No. Uh, no, it's not. Honestly, with Graves, it, he had managed to, um... not get involved, uh, not do anything for so long already. He basically... One of the things you have to remember about the battle in terms of the whole scenario going on with Graves, etc., is that here the person in charge of the van and the person who does the most fighting is Hood. And Hood had actually had to lie. And I mean, quite seriously, lie about the capabilities of his ships in order to get Graves to actually do anything and believe he, believe he was strong enough and needed to do anything. Because otherwise he was going to sit in New York and he was going to, you know, leave it be. Because he didn't think he could do anything. And Graves has a big problems because whilst he's in charge and the senior officer, his ne he is a rear admiral in the battle. And he is the, he's the senior rear admiral, but he's in charge. He's got, as his other rear admirals, a guy called Samuel Hood and another guy called Francis Samuel Drake. Now, Francis, Sir, Sir, Sir Francis Samuel Drake is a very interesting character. He is... I think he's the last of the Drake baronets. Um, who were descended from the nephew of Sir Francis Drake. The guy, uh, the, uh, of course, very famous Elizabethan commander. So, yeah. He was also quite an experienced and quite an aggressive officer. 
pretty much Graves runs into the issues that his two senior commanders other than him are both going, you need to do something, you need to do something, you need to do something. And he eventually does something and once he gets motivated to do something, he then has to do it immediately. So it's not being an issue, it's that Graves is a bit of a well, an idiot. And how can I say this? Because there is a requirement, of course, for officers to get anywhere in the sea. Do you have to be quite sensible? You have to be fairly smart to survive at sea. You do. So, how can someone get to such senior rank and be not? Because... There is a difference between being a good ship commander and being an able task group deputy commander, or even, even task group commander, and a strategist. And one of the things the Royal Navy starts to realise at this point is that some officers are suitable for strategic command and some are not. And that's one of the reasons why there are some reforms put through at various points of the Admirals of the Red, the Blue, and the White scenario. And even Admirals of the Yellow. And the ones who made Admiral of the Permanently Going to Stay Ashore group. Lane Quick. Also, awesome I hope we get to Sufferin's campaign in India. We're not really, because that doesn't really... That does touch on it, but it is not... That's part of the wider discussion. And there's going to be more videos on probably the India and naval warfare in the Indian Ocean in the Age of Sail later in this year. So there's going to be a bit, but it's going to be a bleak on Sovereign today. Now, the Royal Navy are trying their best, but there is a difference between... Admiral who can operate at a strategic level, an Admiral who can't. And once you have the ability to, and I put it slightly, promote officers without necessarily promoting them due to seniority. Because you can go Rear Admiral of the Red, Blue, White, da 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 da. You know, uh, up the various levels. What rank are you going to be? What colour are you going to be? Etc. You can also skip people up if they do good things. And you can pick those people who are good at strategic command, and you can promote them faster than those who are not. So you get an admiral who's perfectly good at task group command, that's fine. They're a nice rear admiral. But they stay a rear admiral of the lowest level you can get for as long as you can. And maybe they never get further than being a rear admiral. Graves should not have found himself in a scenario where he was in strategic command. He would have been perfectly fine back being second in command in the Western Squadron, uh, second in command or third in command of the Western Squadron. He would have been perfectly fine at that level. And this is this is something you learn. And then. Well, thankfully, you start to get a change in 1782. And it's important that the second, uh, you get the change in 1782 because, well, if you hadn't, you'd have been in trouble. In this battle, you have the Royal Navy turn up to fight in the Caribbean with the French. You have the French under the command of Comte de Grasse and Louis de Bonville, and the Royal Navy under the command of Sir George Romney and Sir Samuel Hood. If you're now thinking this does not sound like a good scenario for anyone to be involved in fighting them, you would be quite right. Also, the British brought 36 ships of the line to the French 30. Because the other thing the British have started doing is really ramping up. And whilst they've been dealing the exergence of war, they've been ramping up to the level of actually war fighting operation now, ramping up to the effort of global war, and they have slowly 
building new ships as far as they can, renewing old ships as far as they can, activating old ships. And they have really reached. I mean, there are ships which they have fitted out and readied for war who under normal circumstances would have been left as hulks. Just sitting there doing nothing. But they have got them ready for war and they have sent them to sea. And then you, you look at Rodney's fleet. And Rodney has Sir Samuel Hood, of course, in 98-gun second-rate HMS Barfleur in his charge of his van. You have Rodney himself, of course, in charge of centre in the 98-gun second-rate HMS Formidable. And who turns up again as, flagsh uh, as, as flagship of the rear? Francis Sir Samuel uh, Sir Francis Samuel Drake in HMS Princessa. So you are literally talking at the Battle of Saints. You have the same command crew. You have the same command structure, barring Graves has been replaced by Admiral Sir George Rodney. They now have thirty six ships. Thirty six ships of the line. And the Battle of the Saints is a very, very bad battle for the French. It's a very, very bad battle for the French. The French lose four ships of the line, captured. One vessel's destroyed. Three thousand dead or wounded. Five thousand captured. Now, this was the same French fleet which had managed to achieve the defeat of General Cornwallis. They had won the battle. They had won Chesapeake. And then they are sent to take the Caribbean. The thing was, the Caribbean was considered more valuable to Britain than the entirety of the 13 colonies. In fact, Jamaica alone was considered by George III and Lord Sandwich to be more valuable than the entire North American colonies. And it's at this point that Lord George Germain starts to be sacrificed. Because, yeah, Sandwich sends out a very, very good admiral. An admiral who does not get on with Germain. Paris and Madrid, the two courts, the French and Spanish court, their governments, viewed taking Jamaica as important as taking, trying to take Gibraltar. And remember, in this war, there is the Great Siege of Gibraltar going on. This is the war, the Great Siege of Gibraltar. That's what's happening at the point in, in Gibraltar. So it's important. It's very, very important. Admiral Rodney arrives in the Caribbean with 17 ships of the line. That's where his numerical superiority comes from. He brings 17 ships. When de Grasse sails from Martinique, he sails with 35 ships of the line. By the time they fight the battle, he's bringing 30 against the British 36. The British have also, in the middle of this war, started an infrastructure revolution in that Lord Sandwich has got his way 
and they have started copper sheathing their hulls. Think about that. That has added an extra burden onto their shipyards. It has added an extra burden of cost onto their maritime infrastructure. But they are doing that because they are trying to regain what they perceive as having lost. So this means that the 17 ships especially that Romney has brought with him have all got copper sheathing. So do most of the others by this point. But the 17 ships that are with him are fresh and clean. Yes, they've done a nice voyage across the Atlantic. Yes, that's never go great for hulls, but they are good. His second in command is Hood, and his third in command is Drake. Again, as Graves had at Chesapeake. This was a very, very different battle. There were a lot of pre-battle maneuvers. And... Honestly... Thanks to various scenarios... Various British ships managed to break the French line. And that is the big thing. But they are in line, going to line up to fight and it's considered a perfectly normal battle. And, well, things don't go to plan. Not for the French, for the British. They go, uh, they go to a plan. Rodney's plan. <sighs> By the way, they captured some more French ships afterwards because basically... After the battle, Rodney tells Hood to go hunting. And Hood goes, Woohoo! Prizes, lads! And promptly goes and captures some ships. One of the ships lost was the Ville de Paris. And in kind of a different scenario to um, the scenario in Britain when an admiral had lost and the king and nation had despaired, uh, the Comte de Grasse is told to retire by King Louis, whereas of course John Bing had been executed. Run on Rodney's plan, they're coming, kill them all. Um, no, Rodney's plan was get to French, break up line, beat up line, keep beating up line until they go home. And he even took the Comte de Grasse as prisoner. He took the French he took the French commander in chief as a prisoner. That is Think about how often that happens, that the <laughs> they, they take the per, as personal prisoner the commander-in-chief of the opposing fleet. It'd be like, I don't know. Well. <sighs> it 
It would be like Jellico taking Sheer prisoner and taking him home to the king. And that's actually what Rodney did. Rodney took the grass home to the British king and went, Here is the French commander-in-chief. I have captured him. <laughs> This guy, you know, it's the guy. It, it's a status symbol. Hello, yes, you won a battle. Yes, and I brought home the French commander in chief. Uh, yeah, it, it was, it was, it was not nice for the French. Um, I think it was the the, the a French. I think the French vessel, the Caesar, bro uh, actually burned up and broke up, um, and exploded. Ville de Paris was captured, and that's just not good. Hood, Tumea Hood is the one who takes the grass prisoner for Rodney, and Hood basically um, approaches, decides he's not quite sure if the French are actually surrendering, so he gives a nice broadside at very close quarters to make sure. And when the grass is taken prisoner, well. Every one of his officers seemed to have been killed or wounded, and only three men were unwounded around him whilst he was untouched. Rodney boarded after Hood. Hood had boarded first to make sure there was no one going to threaten Rodney. Basically, Hood was making sure Rodney did not get in any way at all hurt. Uh, as I've said before, it, th there becomes a very interesting thing in the Age of Cell. There are certain admirals who very much go, Right then, that's our boss. We aren't losing him. So if we if he has to do anything dangerous, what is going to happen is I'm going to go first, and somebody's going to go to him, but you're an admiral as well, and you're kind of difficult to lose as well. Yes, but he's more important than I am. I'm reminded of the fa uh, phrase from the old uh, Toenka Barnacle uh, commercial that seems to fit. When it comes to the British, it's not what you got, it's what you do with it. it. There are a few things. It's having the fleet and it's being able to use it. And this is the point. In 1782, the Battle of the Saints is probably the most important battle the Royal Navy have fought in that war. Because they have lost... And they have kept losing. And that has been bad. They have won individual actions. But they have lost quite so much. And... It's been, it's been terrible for the British. It has been. But there is another little important thing in this war, because... The British have learned a lesson of importance sea supply because where they have taken notice, and again, this is the important thing to think about. The British have lost control of the sea. They did lose control of it at several points. They lost their status. They lost their, their sense of being. The Western Squadron was put in place, but it couldn't present, prevent the fleets escaping because it had been so run down to get ships under normal, under refusal to establish them under a special funding or wartime to the American, uh, to send them America, the Western Squadron hadn't been implemented quickly enough, which had allowed the French to get out and do some of the things that happened. Gibraltar didn't fall, though. And that was very, very important. If Gibraltar had fallen, the British would have been in real trouble. The British would have been, well, let's put it this way, Gibraltar is one of the real critical points of British uh, naval strength and power projection. 
losing it would have been a decisive pro a decisive failure. Then click, there was also a hurricane which damaged so many ships from the British, around the British clean out spare, uh, spare spars and masts. Yes. There were various incidents which went against the British at certain points. But they also went against other navies. And again, it's one of those things that it's a factor of life that you have to deal with these issues. You have to deal with that. You have to design the infrastructure and have the infrastructure in place to deal with it. And the Seven Years' War, the British had built up that infrastructure and had been able to deal with it. And then the period between the Seven Years' War and the American Revolutionary War, they'd let it fall. And especially at the start in 1775 with Lord George Germain, you hadn't had a sensible command staff in charge of the war effort. Hi, Jack Ray. And so... you end up with problems. You end up with major problems. And this war is a good example of that. There are major problems. But once the British get themselves organised again, and I would say, key thing is Lord Sandwich. Um, he is the emphasis of Lord George Germain. He really is. I think if there is anyone who, well, in my dream, I would really love, I would really love there to be a statue of the fourth Earl of Sandwich, and I would like it to be outside the UK Parliament. Now, There are differences which go around. Um, one of the things about Sandwich that you have to remember is that he gets a lot of bad press from his political opponents. He was also not as rich as quite a lot of his um, contemporaries. And so they were able to afford far better press than he was. And do things far more traditionally. However, I would say... He is one of the better and one of the more critical ministers we have in the period. He is First Lord of the Admiralty from 1771 to 1782. He's succeeded by Keppel, who is fairly decent. He'd been preceded by Hawk of Quiberon Bay. And Hawke had instituted a lot of things which Sandwich tries to keep going. But he'd also been First Lord of the Admiralty 1763 to, uh, in 1763. 
and he'd been First Lord of the Admiralty for his first time between 1748 and 1751. So if you consider that, he has, by the end of it, he has served in, in the, as First Lord of the Admiralty for 15 years. The longest for single, single stint had been 11 years. 1771 to 1782. He knew his ministry. And he actually tried his best. And please note the I the um, there are several points of which the myth about the modern sandwich coming from Lord being named Lord Sandwich comes about, but. The more popular one is that bread and meat sustained him at the gambling table or at work. Uh, he was a very um, interesting gentleman. The interesting thing is, though, I would say that whilst it's rumoured it was in his gambling pursuits that the sandwich is created, i.e. the meat between bread, um, I would go with Nicholas Rogers, a view that it's actually more likely to be consumed at his work desk, because sandwich is the epitome of work hard, play hard. He could... And he would often spend days in his office working away. And I mean solid days. He was not like other ministers at the time who would very rarely see their ministries. He was in the Admiralty. And he was in the Admiralty. And secretaries and assistants would be there with him as well for those days while he was working. And then he would go, right the crisis over, problems dealt with, and he would go off for days with the Hellfire Club, and then would be gambling for days. The man was a blooming, it was, would definitely was an insomniac of some level. Because he often doesn't seem to be sleeping. The fact he managed to stop long enough to have children is amazing to me. Well, children inside of wedlock. He has quite a few mistresses as well. Um, mm. You know, <sighs> so any questions before we get into the next session about the American Revolutionary War and, well, the Anglo-French War, when Britain lost command of the sea. Are all happy with that and want to get on to the next section. The Hellfire Club did have some very interesting members. Happy? Good. It's interesting to note that he retired from public duty in 1782. 
and basically spent 10 years in retirement enjoying himself at Hinchbrook House. I would say when he retires in 1782, he has both lost his wife, Dorothy Fane, who, um, who he'd had a son with, but she deteriorated and in health and went into insanity and eventually, I think, she dies before him, from memory. Um, yes, she died in 1797, and then his longtime mistress, uh, Martha Ray, also with whom he possibly had as many as nine children, also died in uh, died in 1779. And um, yeah, he basically just decides no more. The American Revolutionary War is significant. It's just it's it's more significant in that it show, it suggests to the to the French and the Spanish that the British have lost the plot and are no longer a functioning major power because of their inefficiency in running the war. And that's mostly being able to be attributed to Lord George Germain, who is a favourite of the king for some reason, despite the king not liking it, having actually kicked him off the battlefield at Minden because he was a coward. Anyway, leaving that to one side, we have the Spithead and Moor Nor Mutinies of 1797. Now, why are these here? Because one cripples the Channel Fleet. Pardon me. Mm -hmm. And one cripples the North Sea Fleet. Hi, Carl. On time, no see, yeah. And pretty much we've peaked and we've gone down. I'm not sure. We, we, we peaked at 44 viewers and we're now at 34. Hmm. Sorry, it's just updated the viewership figures. And yes, this is Admiral Duncan time. Because, okay, right then. Let me just explain something. Spithead is off Spitbank Fort, but it's not Spitbank Fort. It's not quite there. It's in the middle of the water. And honestly, nor is the name of a sort of moving bank in the middle of the Tem in the Thames Estuary up on the north, uh, up in that sort of area. So I have put it up there and roughly found a sign. But just to give you a rough idea of where the distance is. This is the other time the British lose control of the sea. And they lose control of the sea not due to enemy action, but due to... Well, one of them's definitely not due to enemy action. But due to... And this is the problem. Their own management of the fleet. And this is a really interesting thing, because... The point that you have to you, you consider is that the British so far lost control, lost control of the sea not because anyone really took it from them, but because of their own mismanagement, they'd managed to lose it. Because of their own bad leadership, they'd managed to lose it. And perhaps this is a lesson for people who are commanding the sea to this day. You lose control of the sea as a major power if you still have, and if you lose the infrastructure and you stop investing, or if you don't manage it correctly. Cody, if I define enemy action, well, let's put it this way: whilst the French did win some battles, which did contribute to the British loss of the control of the sea, the British management of those battles was sufficiently bad that, frankly, you have issues. You have very big issues. As I've tried to get into. 
In terms of spithead and nor mutinies, well, there is a very simple case here. The Channel Fleet down here are commanded by Admiral Alexander Hood, the younger brother of Admiral Samuel Hood, but senior. He joins the Navy a year before his elder brother to find out what the Navy's like. So actually, he is... The, the elder brother is the junior admiral because the younger brother joined the Navy first. <laughs> but Alexander Hood is less well known than Samuel Hood because Alexander's exploits, he is a very safe, reliable pair of hands, considered a very, very good admiral, steady admiral, and as such he's often put in charge of things like major blockades. Rather than being in charge of dashing around the world of Elan, he is put in charge of keeping fleets organized. And one of the things I would say is this. Hood, Bridport, as he's known, Viscount Briswort, is around and tries to deal and help and manage this, uh, the issues going on with the Channel Fleet. Duncan is mostly watching, trying to watch the, the, the Dutch. They are trying to maintain ships into watching the various French ports that are carrying out the blockade and the Dutch. The thing is, they lose some of those blockades. So, the thing is, some of the blockades are actually closed down. The French don't actually realise this. This is one of the joyous things of this war. Neither, the French do not actually realise the British fleet is collapsing in front of them. They don't know about it. Um, Darius Ratsky, the Americans have mismanaged their infrastructure and they closed all but four shipyards and now they have a long line of ships waiting for repairs. Yeah, that is a problem. That is a problem. You need to manage your infrastructure. And you can't manage it based on a Oh, this is a projected of a perfect of a best case scenario. You always have to predict. You always have to manage your infrastructure space on based on a worst case scenario. What are you going to need if everything goes wrong? Okay, that's what we need then. But it gets forgotten. It's very easy to forget these things. It's very common to forget these things. So. Spithead is Portsmouth. Nor is the Thames. Remember these issues before we get into them. So, Spithead. Well, the Spithead mutiny starts off with 16 ships in the Channel Fleet. They are protesting living conditions. They are protesting a... demanding a pay rise. They want better food. They want more shore leave. And they want compensations for sickness and injury. Fifteen ships at Plymouth also mutiny. So you have sixteen ships in, in Portsmouth and fifteen ships in Plymouth all part of this mutiny in Spithead Mutiny. And the ones at Plymouth send delegates to Spithead to take part in the negotiations. Now, this is actually a very interesting scenario because the pay rates had been established in 1658 at this point. Which is over 140 years ago, really, when this breaks out. Because it breaks out 1797, so it's it's 139 years ago. But let's be honest, at this level, it's an extra year. It's a year of it. And they had been reasonable still during the Seven Years' War. Unfortunately, 
inflation, which really did hit after the Seven Years' War, an explosion of especially consumer, consumer goods and foodstuffs, had meant that the pay had been eroded in value. And whilst pay rises had been granted to the army, to the militia and naval officers, with the cost of coppering and etc., there had been a desire to maybe not increase the sailors' pay, as it felt they might not realise it. But also, coppering had another, another thing, another consequence, because it meant that Ships didn't need to go to return to port as frequently, which was great for maintaining blockade. But it meant that there was additional time at sea. Which increased the difficulty of sailors' work and, and decreased the frequency of opportunities for leave. The Royal Navy hadn't really made any adjustments. They'd ignored this all. Now, some people bring up the, uh, the fashion of impressment, but honestly, the impress is never as big a factor as movies and a lot of popular culture likes to make it out to be. It is a factor. Please do not get me wrong. But it isn't as big a factor because, again, think about this from a ship's pers a crew's perspective or a captain's perspective. Volunteers are always better and more easy to motivate than people who are pressed. So popular captains, popular admirals would often fire, would often raise their standards and recruit crews quite easily. They've been having more trouble as the wars had gone on after the Seven Years' War because the pay value of pay had decreased, but with the promises of prize money especially the popular ones, the good ones, the ones who are associated with victories and with prize money, especially, still got plenty of volunteers, didn't rely on, need to rely on press. The trouble is the converse of that. The officers who weren't popular, who weren't necessarily as good, they didn't have the advantage of decent pay, and so they were having to rely on press. And this ends up causing issues. Whilst they are a smaller group of officers, and therefore it's a fewer number of ships than you would think were, depending on the press, those ones are ter t tend to be the issues. Now, the fact is, during this war, impressment tends also to be, to also mean uh, are sailors and tends to more be an issue where you get sailors being transferred from one ship to another ship as soon as they can before they can come back from you. So basically, what you'd have, what more comes in terms is feature impressment than wandering around the shore, is as a warship is coming in from uh, from a, a voyage, they would take send some of their crew to another ship which is going straight out. And just imagine which crew a captain will send at that scenario. The ones who have been well behaved, who are a good crew, who he wants on next voyage, or the ones who have caused him issues. There is also a quota system, which meant that they had landsmen, often convicted criminals, who had been sent to see a Navy instead of punishment, and they didn't always integrate with the career sailors, but... They weren't as much of a problem as, again, sometimes some histories and some culture, uh, some book, uh, books and movies have made out. Because, honestly, you in the... Let's put it this way. In the close confines of a warship of this period, a just sailship, if you've ever wandered around HMS Victory, and that's a far better example of a ship of the line and what they are than most frigates and how close they are, 
Um, you can't really have beef with anyone and it not get uh, not cause enough of a problem that someone's going to deal with it. And in the nicest way, the petty officers will deal with it. And they will deal with you. They will work out who the problem is and they will deal with you. Now, they focused their demands and they negotiated with the Admiralty for roughly a couple of weeks. Um... They focused on, they wanted the abolition of the purse's pound, where instead of, because uh, there are 16 ounces in a pound, but um, the purser used to keep, would be allowed to keep two of every pound, so they would give out 14 ounces of meat. And they wanted better pay uh, instead of, you know, 16. And they wanted some of the unpopular officers, some of the less capable officers, removed. They didn't bother about... They weren't upset about flogging. They didn't want... In, they wouldn't want impressment removed. Um, the mutineers actually managed to maintain regular naval routine and discipline aboard their ships. They kept most of the, most of the, the officers remained aboard their ships. And they actually allowed ships to leave for convoy escort duty or patrols. And they promised, this is important with the Spithead Mutiny, they promised to suspend the mutiny and go to sea immediately if French ships were spotted heading for English shores. So if you consider, this mutiny has basically said, look, we're refusing to go to sea, but we're refusing to go to sea because we want food and we want better pay. And But if the French come out, we'll fight. We're still fighting. We're not refusing to fight the French. We're not treasonous here. We just want better treatment. Now, at various points, negotiations did break down. And some officers were even treated... Uh, some of the uh, unpopular officers were sent ashore and others were treated with signs of deliberate disrespect, i.e. no one saluted them. But... Lord Howe is sent to intervene. This is Admiral Lord Howe. Again, if you remember this gentleman, uh, we have talked about him involved in fair, a, a fair number of battles and things over the years. He's a, a fairly successful officer. Uh, he has been given command of the Channel Fleet at various points. He was involved in the relief of the Great Siege of Gibraltar in 1782. He'd been First Lord of the Admiralty at various points. He, took, of course, did command at, in the glorious 1st of June in 1793. So, we are dealing with a very experienced, very favoured officer is sent to negotiate with them. He comes to talk with them. And what does he agree? Well, he immediately issues a royal pardon for all the crews. King's given him permission to that. He reassigns the unpopular officers. Because most of the unpopular officers are not considered good officers by their fellow officers. And they love a chance to get rid of them. And this gives them an excuse to get rid of them. And... Agrees to the pay, a pay rise and abolishes the pusser's pound. And they go back to sea. But think about that. For a while, for a few weeks, May and June 1797. Well, it lasts from April to May 1797. It's April and May 97. I'm sorry, I was doing the same May and June, but it's actually April and May 1797. The Royal Navy is there. The Channel Squadron is down by 31 ships. That's a big loss. It was more like a naval strike. And it was very, very... Um, it's, the Spithead is very different than Nor.
Come on, we won't go there. I'm about to be acting mad curator due to bad management. Good luck. Nice to tell the the whole impression was not a major factor as far as the Americans are a major factor. Uh, no, um, that's uh, let's put it this way: Knight Six Eight Three One. You you always have to remember that there are things which are casus bellis, which are issues which are casus bellis, but they don't necessarily have to involve a lot of people. And the problem for the Americans was that a they still spoke English and sounded kind of like some of the people in Britain. The accents hadn't diverged enough at that point. But also you had some British people who claimed to be American would go to America, claim they're American sailors, and then would be serving on, and then would get themselves pressed onto Brit get themselves serving on a British flag ship. And claim, well, I'm American, so you can't impress me. Well, you sound British and you're serving on a British merchant ship. So we're gonna presume you're British. But again, it's when you look start to look into the exact numbers and you start to look at them, you, it's a very, very small number of people. It's a very, very small number of people. It's not nice for those people involved. Please don't get me wrong. But it has a political impact far outside, uh, far outsizing its real terms numer and numeracy for the Royal Navy. And... You have to remember, the negotiations in this one had actually broken down. The Spithead River broke down because they were worried that the pardons for mutineers wasn't really going to be followed through. And that's one of the reasons why Lord Howe has to come down to negotiate with them. Because they trust Lord Howe when he says you're going to get pardoned. And they do. Now, the Nor, that's a different scenario. If we go back here, you can see there's automatically a very different issue between the Nor and Portsmouth. Nor is on the Thames. Thames leads to London. London is the major port of Britain at this time. So, there's already a recipe for potential issues. Now, on the 12th of May, nor mutinied. And, well, This was a different kettle of fish from the beginning. For starters, uh, when they when they at first sort of seized control of the ship, they seized control of the ship at five bells of dog watch, which is one of the reasons why the Royal Navy never rings five bells anymore. Um. It was organized across the fleet, and several other ships also had the same issue. HMS Sandwich was the first one. Now you can see that's a problem, because they're seizing the ship which is named for the first Lord of the Admiralty. Lord Sandwich. Now... The problems for the mutineers was that it was more spread out from the beginning. But they elected delegates from each ship. And um, there is an interesting character called Richard Parker, who you can see here being hanged in the, from the Newgate uh, calendar. He was a former master's mate who'd been disrated and court-martialed in 1793 and had re-enlisted in the Navy earlier in 1797. 
he was serving aboard the brig sloop, the Hound. So, we are asked to believe that someone who's been back in the Navy for a few months, who is a disrated master's mate, is a senior leader in the, in the mutiny going on. I don't think so. The mutiny at Nor, like the mutiny at Spithead, is most likely being organised and led by the, the petty officers. You must remember, for all the increase in sailors' pay, in base rate pay, etc., that's going to impact the petty officers even more. They will get an even higher rate. They get an even better treatment. Now, here is the small problem with this fleet. If we consider at Spithead, they were offering still to serve. And they basically said, we want more food, we want more pay, and we want more food. And we want some idiot officers gone. So Spithead's demands were actually considered quite reasonable. And they had good press because of that. And also, they very carefully kept everything very civilised. Didn't attack other, or didn't attack officers, didn't cause any issues. Now... The problem is, once you start putting all these various groups of people together in Nor, they come up with eight demands. These demands involve things like pardons for them all. That's fine. Increased pay. That's already been got by uh, already being got by the Spithead mutiny, so it doesn't really matter. But okay, Garnet. They want modification of the Articles of War. Oh, that's a big issue. That why, why are you getting involved in the Articles of War? And they wanted to demand that the king... They also demanded that king dissolve Parliament and make immediate peace with France. Um, the Admiralty offered the concessions they'd already made at Spithead, but these were turned down. And after making the demands they had, for some reason the Admiralty started getting worried about this group at Nor. So they got HMS Neptune, which was 90, had 98 guns, i.e. is a second rate. And gave command of her to Captain Sir Erasmus Groa, Goa. And he put together a flotilla of 50 loyal ships in the Upper Thames to prevent the mutineers moving on the City of London. At this point, the mutineers start to realise they might have issues. However, the mutineers decided to double down. And they decided to try and blockade London by preventing merchant vessels from entering the port, entering the, the, the Thames. They were actually achieving something which France hadn't in a long time. A blockade of London. Several principals made plans, i.e. the senior delegates like Parker made plans to sail their ships to France. They were getting very political. And this meant that a lot of the sailors started withdrawing from the group. And they started losing ships. In that ships were mutinying on the mutineers. Because they were thinking, hang on, this has got weird. Who's in charge of this? This isn't what we wanted. But of course, now with ships leaving them and telling telling the Admiralty exactly what's going on, the Admiralty starts to get scared that these ships might be taken to France. And then the meeting starts to reach various people cruising off a shant, etc., like um, the squadron under St. John Warren.
the crew aboard HMS Galatea decided to confine Richard Goodwin Keats, her captain, but returned with the whole squadron to Plymouth. None of them wanted it, and none of them, it was found, wanted treason. They wanted improvements in the conditions. And, you know, that crew, in terms of Galatea, well, she was a nice fifth-rate 32. And uh, when she got back to shore and Keats was released and prize money was secured and the other pay issues were settled, it was found that the crew had not been paid in an overly long and very suspiciously long time on Galatea. Uh, that was quickly <clears throat> looked into, and it was found that there were interesting things going on there. They returned to their station. Now, at a certain point in June, because the Nor, Nor, Nor system, Nor mutiny started later than the Spithead one, so they're still going in June. Uh, they decided that they would allow uh, per merchant vessels to pass the blockade, and only Royal Navy victualling ships would be detained. Uh, the idea was that, well, various reasons. One, it was impractical, and they were actually finding trying to interdict the trade in the in the Thames to be a nightmare, uh, quickly spiking up resources. And the other reason was that, frankly, PR-wise, they'd shot themselves in the foot because everyone who was potentially on their side in London and in court was now against them. And the trouble is, the Nor's leadership, Nor's mutinies leaderships, had shown that they had aims beyond pay and living conditions, which meant the Admiralty was really not inclined to give in to them. Whereas the Spithead mutiny had been considered a model mutiny, it was a strike in many ways has already been written here. It was considered approachable. It was understandable. The Nor mutiny was considered revolutionary. And so, what was the Royal Navy doing? Well, they stopped, they stopped, making, uh, stopped allowing them to get food and water. And so, when Parker hoists the signal, or rather, when the signal is hoisted from the ship Parker is aboard, for the ships to sail to France, the ships all refuse to follow. The mutiny breaks down entirely internally because it seems at a certain point the leadership of the Nor Mutiny had been lying to the sailors they were supposed to be representing about what they've been saying. And it's all very shadowy. The Nor Whereas we know quite well, we can find out information, we know fairly well who were the leaders at Spithead, we really find the Nor Mutiny a very interesting issue to try and get into. You can believe Parker's in charge, but... The whole delegate structure seems a bit weird. For how those personnel got picked to be in charge are not the people we would think would normally be picked in a mutiny to be in charge. Either this truly is a revolution, a lower ranks mutiny which is somehow led by the lower ranks, or there is something very iffy going on in their leadership selection. Hi, Glenn Stewart. And hi, Ian Morrison. Now, with the ships refusing to follow them to France, it's at that point that ships like HMS Clyde, with Captain Charles Cunningham in charge, manages to persuade, manage to get their crews to return to duty, and they go to Sheerness, and others start to follow them. Eventually, most ships slip their anchors deserted. Some of those ships deserting the mutiny, mutineers were actually fired on by the mutineers. Again, very different from Spithead. 
At no point in Spithead are they try are the mutineers having to trying to maintain cohesion by force. They are maintaining cohesion by working together, not by shooting each other. And then the mutiny collapses. Parker, convicted of treason, piracy, and hanged from the yardarm on Sandwich. And 29, uh, 29 were hanged in total. 29 were imprisoned and 9 were flog flogged. While others were sent to Australia. They were transported. One of them, William Redfern, who was a surgeon's mate, um, who was actually transported to Austra Australia, became a very respected surgeon and landowner in New South Wales. But there are issues. There are various issues put together. Um, some have tried to suggest that the Nor Mutiny was more a result of the United Irishman. Others have said it was French spies and insurrection. Others have said that it was... It was the work of, uh, that the... It was the work of more adventurous and eager chiefs who pushed forward others to stand in their stead while pulling strings from behind. There are many potential options. There is even the po option that it was set up as it was. They put younger people in charge because they knew with them being on the Thames, it had the potential for it to become far more high risk. So the chiefs put... People in charge, uh, people theoretically in charge, as figureheads, and those figureheads ran away from them. The chiefs lost control of the situation. There is that as an option. There are many potential options, but it doesn't really work. And you do also have in this whole Norse scenario, you have my favourite ever situation from a Royal Navy ship. Admiral Duncan's flagship. This is aboard Admiral Duncan, who will later on in the year fight, Camp uh, fight the Battle of Camperdown against the Dutch. Attempts the mutiny. He hears the commotion. He walks out of... He walks out of from his rooms. Sees what's going on. Seizes! One of the lead mutineers holds him over the side of the ship physically in his own hand in front of them all goes, Who would like to relieve me of command of my ship? There is a debate where he says my ship or my fleet. Either way, does it really matter? Everyone's just looking at this well over six foot mountain of an admiral holding a man a oh, one armed over the side of his ship like he's nothing and they just go you know what admiral we think you're in charge you're our admiral we love you we're going back down to bed now everyone back away He doesn't choke slam the guy. He holds him by his neck over the water. <laughs> he lit it's not choke slam. It's grab and you will go over there. <laughs> You're dangling over the side. Anyone wants to relieve me of command of my fleet? Oh, I'm doing it the second time. Uh, you know, it's just it's a uh... yeah. Uh, none of us want to fight him. <laughs> He's a bit being scary. <laughs> <sighs> um, I think Sir Charles Cunningham might be a relation to the other Cunningham. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure.
He, I know he had a lot of children, and I know a lot of his sons did join the Navy. And he lived to 1834. But I'm not 100% sure whether he is, whether that Cunningham is a, um, a direct relation or, or um, to the later Admiral, uh, to either John Cunningham or um, Andrew Cunningham. Darth Vader school. <laughs> well, the thing is, actually, Admiral Duncan was quite popular. So it was kind of the crew realizing two things. One, this was an admiral who tended to listen to them. And two, and the next, it was the very next day, you know, he, he on his ships had the pusser's pound eradicated immediately. Basically, he, the moment he heard about it, he went, Honestly, I didn't realize this was still happening. It hasn't. Because, again, you have to remember, the captain provides the food at his own table. So by the time you become an admiral, and you've been an officer anyway, you've been away from the pusser's pound for such a long time, as it affecting you, you might well, it doesn't affect your daily life. So you probably don't pay much attention to it, as long as you've got enough food for the the crew aboard. It's a problem, though. And the moment it's raised as a problem... Yeah. Sorry, brain phase out of this. What was Pastor's Pound? Well, a Pastor's Pound was that basically a Pastor would carry a pound of meat. Pound is 16 ounces. But they would give you 14 ounces and keep two ounces back. So the pound they would give you was 14 ounces. The pound, But a pound of meat is 16 ounces. And this meant that you were not getting necessarily what you felt you were owed. Basically, they were allowed to keep the two um, the two pounds difference as their own payment for their supplying you with food. So they would keep the two pounds. So basically, for every uh, for a pound you bought, you get fourteen ounces, and they get two ounces for their own their own consumption and use. It was a um, interesting issue, but it meant that when you were supposed to be allocated, oh, you're going to be allocated X number of pounds of meat and X number of pounds of food, uh, you know, a day. You actually got fourteen ounces rather than eight or sixteen ounces, so you didn't get a full pound, and it was. Not much, but enough to be annoying. Busband was there for a reason, though. Uh, protecting Purser against the risk of spoilage. So when they abolished it, how did they protect the Purser against spoilage? It was... It had been there, put in for protection against spoilage in earlier times when the spoilage had been far more risk. With better food storage, better preservation, and better logistics, it was arguably no longer necessary. In fact, honestly, uh, it probably wasn't necessary by a couple, uh, by a few wars previously, because of that. It's kind of like the baker's dozen, but whereas the baker tends to produce more than twelve to guarantee they have twelve decent buns. Um, well, the per the purser could eat it. The purser could declare it as spoilage, or the purser could sell it off extra. Let's show the Darth Vader School of Management. I would like to think that when I, I I've always imagined whenever I uh, when I saw that first thing because I'd actually read about Admiral Duncan before I saw Star Wars. This is true. 
I read Admiral Duncan before I ever saw Star Wars. So I knew about that incident. So when I saw that in the movie, I thought, oh, they must have studied, they must have heard about that. And I, to this day, do not know if anyone on the Star Wars film set knew that story about Admiral Duncan holding someone up by their neck over the sea. But I like to believe they did. I have done no, no, no research into whether they knew that at all, whether they're modelling that on tour. I'm sure they weren't. But I like to believe they did. Or, of course, buy £14 and charge name for 16 Yep. Azovki, even more basic, who's a Persa? Persa is... It's an interesting rank. It's kind of the banker slash logistics officer of a age of sale vessel. So they're in charge of sorting out and acquiring all the food, or uh, making sure the crew get paid, everything. They are very, very, they are usually the rich, uh, one of the richest people aboard. So, sort of like a quartermaster. Measure it, becomes a perk and the folks getting it never want to give it up. Yes. Exactly. But, it's an issue. It becomes a very big issue. And for the Royal Navy, how is the Spithead and all mutinies really shown off to be, you know, turn around? Well, there's the Battle of Camperdown. And Admiral Duncan wins that with a very organised and very well-drilled fleet against the Dutch, who are a very organised and well-drilled fleet. And... I have often been told, to, uh, been heard to say that the, you know, the Battle of Cumperdown is a far, far greater risk than the Battle of Trafalgar in many, many regards. Because A, he's taking a fleet which is not long ago mutinied into battle. And B, it's against the Dutch, who are probably one of the finest sailing nations the world has ever known. There is a very big difference between, though, the Nor Mutiny and the Spithead Mutinies. A very big difference. And that's something which is worthwhile remembering. The Spithead Mutiny achieved everything which the Nor Mutiny, most of the mutineers in Nor wanted to go for. So, in many ways, they didn't really... The, you can argue the Nor Mutiny wasn't really necessary in the first place. Sorry, mosquito came in. I don't fancy being bitten. I don't fancy setting up a colony here. All right. As I was seeing, they were getting one eighth of every sailor's ration. Guess they didn't eat us. Well. Let's put it this way. So. In. 1677. The sailors rations. The standard rations. Had been a pound of biscuit. A gallon of beer. A weekly rations of eight pounds of beef. Or four pounds of beef. Two pounds of bacon or pork. And two pints. Uh, Two pints of peas. Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday were meat days. On Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, they were served fish with two ounces of butter and four ounces of Suffolk cheese. Or, alternatively, they were served... I think it was roughly three ounces of cheddar cheese, because it was considered cheddar cheese was better for you than Suffolk cheese. 
So you only needed, you needed less cheddar to get the same, you know, level of deals. Um, and later on, the fish rations were replaced with oatmeal and sugar in about 1730s. And honestly, disturbingly enough, Captain Cook would have complained about the fact that the rations had stayed remarkably the same by the time he is still in he is doing what he's doing around the world. Um, but 1796, here are the here are the supplies of HMS Victory. Um, in December 1796, this is what she takes on. Uh, seven thousand uh, seven seventy six thousand and fifty four pounds of bread. Um, six pints of Wine, uh, 135 gallons of vinegar. I think I think that could be the wrong way around, but I'm not sure. Um, 1,680 eight-pound pieces of beef. 308 pounds of fresh beef. So the eight-pound pieces of beef are salted beef, which is the preserved stuff. Uh, they've got 1,921 quarter pound pieces of pork. Oh, no, half. Got it. 1,921 four pound pieces of pork. And uh, let's see. 260. 79 bushels of peas. Uh, I'm not sure what a bushel of pea is. I, uh, peas, I really do not know what a bushel is. That sounds like far too many vegetables to me. Um, 1,672 gallons of oatmeal. 12,315 pounds of flour. Uh, 315 pounds of malt. 171 gallons of oil. And 163 bags of biscuits. Now, please note though, until 1806, the only qualification to be required to become a ship's cook, this is not a captain's cook, a ship's cook, there's a difference, was to be a Greenwich chess pensioner, which meant that you had lost a limb in service normally. Um, they often had no formal culinary training, and they acquired their skills for experience. So, again, this could be an interesting issue. But, let's put it this way, if you mucked up the food, it was not unusual... For the cat, uh, for the crew to get very demonstrative when they were annoyed with you over your over the food. Now, there is of course the other end of the scale, and um, it's worthwhile noting this on the food. And the sailors would see this going on. Admiral Robert Digby's steward aboard the HMS Prince George in 1781 and kept a menu book. And by the way, I am shamelessly nicking this from an uh, uh, nicked this information, this all this food article stuff. I do not do this level of research. But I found a history hit webpage which had a load of food research on it done. So I have nicked stats from there if you want to go and find out. Because honestly... This is going to sound terrible, but this is... If you want me to go and talk about how to build a ship, I have done the research and I love doing that. But the moment I got into this, I thought, you are all going to want to have questions about food. You're going to want questions about food. I'd better have something in my notes somewhere ready to go for food because the puzzle's pan is going to come up and the food's going to come up. So, on this scenario, um, Admiral Robert Digby ate uh, and his guests... 
at one point ate a meal of mutton hash, roast mutton, mutton stocks, roast duck, potatoes, butter, cabbages, stewed cauliflower, corned beef, plum pudding, cherry and gooseberry tarts. That doesn't sound like a bad thing. And you have to remember also again that ships often carried livestock. They often carried cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, but of course most common were geese, hens, chicken. They used to provided fresh meat, milk and eggs. Um, and fresh vegetables and fruit were often brought or bought whenever it was possible. So, um, those are available. There's also, of course, seagulls and rats, which could also supplement the diet. I... It's fun. It's fun. Can't ask me, dried yellow peas or green peas? I have no idea. I'm presuming green peas. Just one. Google says 20 to 26 pounds for bushels of peas. That's a lot of peas. That's a lot more peas than I... I think both me and Draconafel would consider that amount of peas to, heading towards us to be some version of a war crime. And I know that's probably... <laughs> yeah, Verdana just put, Drac is now carrying corner and having to, all the, having to eat that many peas. Yeah. Um, yeah, that amount of peas coming towards me. Let's be honest, considering the rest of their diet, oh good lord, imagine the amount of gas that was produced by that crew. Oh, good. They didn't need wind. To, well, they certainly had a different source of wind power. Perhaps this is the secret this is the secret to some of the Royal Navy's age of sail speed. It was the pea supply to the crew. <laughs> interesting. Probably for the best that Drak didn't drink the sailor's ration in booze during the episode then. Yeah, it would have been interesting. I shouldn't. I think that's one of the big things Fisher does for the Navy for. Fitting ships at their own bakery so you get fresh bread every day is a popular new move. Who knew? Um, HMS Verdun, that's the reason they're carrying flour to bake bread. They do bake bread. They do try... Uh, but it's... It's not bread like we would probably imagine bread. And we see it, and yes, as ships get better and bigger and more modern ships, you do get more modern culinary facilities. But it's one of the things that is that the messing doesn't change really until you get post Second World War. Post Second World War is when you really have the modern idea of the messing and the food structure on ships. Come in. Vinegar can be watered down into a kind of wine. It's not one I would want to drink. And again, there this mood is going. Interesting. This one, ships carried livestock forever. My step-grandfather was one, also had one even in World War II. He is listed as a ship's mascot. I'm sure the potential for eggs for breakfast didn't hurt that happening. No. Um... It's, you know, the cows were supplied by the Navy. Any other form of livestock was supplied by the crew. I should mention, I mentioned the United Irishman, but I didn't mention the London Corresponding Society, which was um, uh, a group which was kind of supporting the French 
revolution, and they are another group which could well have been involved in the Nor mutiny. They were interesting groups. They were interesting people and interesting times. Uh, sure, Mark. Is that because post war there was a manpower crunch? They didn't need to attract more people. Actually, there isn't really a manpower crunch because you have to remember they keep they maintain um, conscription into the nineteen fifties. And the Royal Navy is usually more volunteer heavy than conscripts because people realize very quickly that if you volunteered for Navy, you got higher pay and you got better looked after and there's all sorts of advantages. So that has a factor. But also, it's more a case of the, uh, the Navy sort of looking at the ships and going, hang on, is this efficient anymore? And once you've got a whole load of electronics and things going on, you want to have people eating sensibly. And once you're getting rid of the spaces where they used to hang their hammocks, once you get away from having hammock spaces into bunk spaces, okay, well, you've now got a dining facility that's set up as a dining facility pretty much all the time. It might as well be a dining facility. And you've got the, re you've got the kitchen next to it, and you can ensure better quality control of the food. You can ensure better health of the crew if you do it centrally. And you can also ensure less wastage. Sounds terrible, but it's less wastage once you're crewing, you're feeding a larger number of people. We are a long way from gourmet wrapped. Michael, in battle, what happened to the livestock? Throw no board, stop below deck, and how do you strike down livestock quickly? Uh, often they are taken down below deck, and believe it or not, it's a crane. And it's use using basically lashings, wood, um, <laughs> on the mast. You rig up a sort of derrick crane scenario on the mast, and you get the cattle down below. It's, 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 it, let's put it this way. There is, you have to remember, battles very rarely come on quickly. Okay? Usually you have a few hours warning. So, there is preparing for battle quickly, and there is modern preparing for battle for quickly. And the range of ships versus their ability to see each other and attack each other is different. And their speed of movement, yes. Yeah, that was the thing. You you have a lot of beer because it's far easier to preserve. Nice ignorance. So when an age of sail ship, uh, sink, ship sinks, none of the livestock survives. It's very rare the livestock survives. It's very rare. But it's also very rare the livestock gets killed in the battle. So often, you have cattle which are taken prisoner. That it's it's. If you read some of the battle accounts, some of the accounts, yes, it included in the things taken from the enemy are cattle, and chickens, and ducks. I'm not sure. Sometimes they choose the officer's goat over the officer. I don't think many officers actually brought a goat with them. Oh, it's good times. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this evening. I, I'm going to be doing a slightly naughty scene. I'm not going to be doing anything on, um, on Discord or anything this evening because. I have to be in London pretty early tomorrow morning to make sure to record some TV stuff. So 
I'm going up to uh, Waterloo tomorrow. That's where I'm going to be recording tomorrow. So, I've got all my notes. Gonna try and, well, if not sleep, get to be, uh, be, lie in bed for a good while this evening and tonight. And, uh, yeah. Be prepped for tomorrow. And hopefully, when it comes out, you'll see it. Uh, it's got, I think it's... I think it's another program which is more likely to come out in America before the UK, but I won't be able to announce what it is until, well, I'll have to check with them if they don't mind me announcing what it is. I'll have that discussion with them tomorrow. Age one, yeah, 14 knots is considered mad speed in the era by Warrior and Sail and Engine. 11 knots pretty fast in 8060s. Battles take a long time to really happen. Yes, they do. Also, note for tomorrow. Um, because I wasn't sure what time I'd be home. If I am home in time, there will of course be a live on Twitch. If I am not, don't worry, there will still be some Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts to view tomorrow because tomorrow the first in Series 4 of the Key Ship series is going live. And that's going to, they're going to, they start off with the Lion Class. And basically, I'm calling Series 4 the Unconstructed Fleet. And they're going to have the Lions, the Montanas, the Sovetsky Soyuz, the H Class, the Dutch Dream of 1913, the Number 13 Class of the Japanese, the Zine A150 Class of the Japanese, Incomparable. It seems sensible to do, to do HMS Incomparable because, you know. She's worthwhile. Uh, she's fun to look at, and she's often discussed. Uh, Alsace class of the French, Erzat Monarch class. Again, we haven't done them, uh, but it seemed appropriate to them. And then we do get on to Key Ship Series Five, which is going to start in September. Um, so Key Ship Series Four will take us through August and July. Uh, starting tomorrow, and then it's in September we're starting the Key Ship Series 5. I have planned out Key si Ship Series 4, 5, and 6. And 6 takes us into October. I might well be off for a research trip at some point in October or November, because honestly, as I said, I want to get at least one of the books, and I've explained about the, um, the 45,000 word books, the, uh, the, the books which are going candle, the issues currently having in terms of cost of pictures versus and cost of research and the cost which are just basically coming. Uh, it's, the it's the classic thing of paychecks late, which happens, and the costs of everything being slightly more than that, I was estimating them to be, because the cost of everything have gone up. So it's annoying, but that means that book. I'm ho it depends. It's going to come out. It's going to depend on when I've accomplished the last research trips because there's some things I need to need to check, double check before I want to publish. So if I get that research trip done in October, the book will be published in November. Yeah, the book. Well, maybe books. I might manage to get two out in November. If I get the research trip not if the research trip doesn't get done till November, then they'll come out in December. And yes, I will say now. So you know, that's all coming up, and that's announcements basically for the rank year. I will also say now that. Um, no, sure. I apologize, Nigel, for me. That was a crisis. I will email. I will do. Nigel loves the fact that he comes up on this channel. Please note, my agent, the guy who looks after and makes sure I get the TV booking, loves to, uh, does watch the channel, watches the chat, and is working out whether at some point he should start actually answering questions in the chat because he comes up as a, as a topic of conversation occasionally and as a personal introduction. But um, leaving that to one side, the with the Lion class, especially, the, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, there is going to be part of that video is also going to include what might have been the response to Yamato have been. 
Hope you'll enjoy that. Anyway, thank you very much everyone for watching. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you everyone who's... I've recently had some more people become... Um, big pun patrons. And some people have upped their patron. And that's always very nice. I get that email and I go, ooh, that's nice. And it is nice. It's One of the interesting things was one I got recently and this was a, this caused me a bit of a laugh but I, I'm, I did laugh with them and I told them I was going to use example but they, they pay uh, they are some of the patrons who pay yearly and they decided to up their amount but they upped their amount they didn't realize after they'd already paid for the year in advance so they've upped their amount for next year and then they sent me an email apologizing about it I went no 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 worry no please don't worry about it it's very kind of you that you're upping it and don't they're sort of getting what no no it was very kind it's very kind of them to it's very kind of everyone for your support honestly uh, again i was having a discussion actually this morning with some other some junior academics and they can't believe the fact that i am making research trip plans and i am working out the approach i am in terms of work based on your support, basic, uh, basic. They just, they, they have no concept of this for that because they're still. I, I still do that. I still apply for research grants, and they're entirely living on the hope of the research grants. And there's me going, well, if I get the research grant, that's great. If I don't, well, I'll, I will base the, I base the plans not on re and whether I get the research grants now. I now treat the research grants as the bonus. I base the research plans based on likely income from YouTube and Patreon. And that's thanks to you. I can look ahead. I can have a year's research plan, a research plan a year in advance because of your support. I can look at doing a conference in Crete next year in May because of your support. Because even if the trip and I have priced it <laughs> and as usual with naval history research conferences, it's designed around the concept of you get a grant or you don't go. So it's not exactly cheap, but hopefully I get a grant. But also the fact is I've worked out and gone, well, if I do manage to get the funding work through and I do get the books published like I want to, the 45,000 word books on Kindle, and they do sort of okay, i.e. they sell at least a thousand copies each, I should be able to afford it. Even if I don't get the grant. Because of you. Because I can afford to do everything I'm doing. I am not doing bath tube histor bathtub historians. That's, that's too much. Hot tub historians? Yes. There will be more hot tub historians. Creek, remember, you have to down, plan to deal with German paratrooper landings. I will do. Actually, mostly what I'm having to deal with is I'm looking at the hotels prices of their recommended hotels and the Hilton is cheaper. And the Hilton is not exactly cheap. This is the thing. I was looking at it going, you are recommending X, Y, and Z hotels that are on... And I was... Please note, first thing I've done is I'm looking at bookings.com and the various ratings of hotels and the way people have written about hotels when I'm sort of going over it going, should I apply... Okay, this is interesting. These hotels, looking at the looking at the reports of the people, and mm, and this is as much as that one, and that one is getting far higher ratings, but that's not on their recommended list. Why not? Well, possibly because it's thirty minutes away. It's thirty minutes by taxi away from where the they're having the conference. But honestly, that wouldn't bother me. My gooch, when do you expect to have the Kindle books published? It's going to depend on when I get to the last research trip. So it's basically going to depend is if I get the paychecks I'm supposed to, which are the final paychecks from some for this year's work from some of my universities. So I can pay my tax bill, my car, my, uh, car service and MOT, and uh, all the stuff I need to do, which is roughly comes into roughly I've got three thousand pounds worth of bills this month. Great. If I can pay all that, then I can do the tri the research trip in October. 
if I can't pay all that, if that pay, those paychecks don't come in, and I need to fudge things around, then it's probably going to get delayed to November. If the research trip gets delayed to November, publication gets delayed till December. If the research trip doesn't, so it's basically it's it's the typical joy of being a contract lecturer and the life you live. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ins Morrison. Thank you, Paul Emmes. Thank you, Michael Cooch. H. Vidan. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn Stewart. Thank you, Just Funk. Thank you, Abazaski. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, David Golding. And thank you, Runon. Thank you, Lane Quick. Uh, thank you, Knight6831. I'm looking forward to 15 questions on Sunday. Thank you, Calvin Gasberg. Thank you, Michael Cooch. And. Yeah. HS1 Hilton is not cheap, but it has good members discounted by pages. Yes, and I I am a member, and that does build up, and it gets very, very good for me at the moment with Hilton, especially as thanks to the last month in Australia. So I'm I'm quite happy with them. It's 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 one of the things of I use Hilton as the standard. So I check and compare things to Hilton because of my membership. And because there are there are two companies I work with where literally that's where they will put you up whenever you go and work on them. And so I build up points. And they do that for... Honestly? They do that because they have affiliate links with Hilton. And that's what they're... They have an agreement with Hilton that they will always put their, um, their employees up with them when they go and do their work. And yeah, that helps me build up membership points on them. <laughs> Just one. My grandparents had one of those mats with a blower on it. Turned a regular hot tub into a hot tub. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. Nice Would you agree the British for the, the better for Britain, Britain for a delayed World War II or British World War II had been done to death? As we know, the IJ would have 1942 World War II start. Uh... No. I think there are still discussions to be had as what's going on. But yeah, there are some. Muggage, you do realize you have to redesign the Shem's book lug side. I will do. Uh, what I'll do is it'll come into, there'll be still one book on one side. And I've already worked out, if we go through here, the Shem's book plug. So it's currently got some merch, which is my favorite piece of merch, which is the fact I've got a doggy scarf going around that you put on your doggy. And I have them for both my dogs. But this is not one of my dogs with it on. And basically, the Seamus book plug will end up with this is the big so this is the big one, and then there'll be two images in diagonal form of merch and two of the Kindle book cover and the Kindle book covers, because that's the hardback the hardback physical book you can buy. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you, HS Ford. Thank you, Felix B. Good luck for her done. Thank you, everyone, and um, bye. Thank you again for all your support. Thank you, Ad85.